Double Toil and Trouble, a novel by Donald Harrington. To Dick McDonough. Epigraph. Hecate. Oh, well done. I commend your pains, and every one shall share in the gains. And now about the cauldron sing, like elves and fairies in a ring, enchanting all that you put in. Chapter 1. Young Hawk Tuttle was sweeping the platform one morning when the twice-weekly train from Fayetteville came steaming slowly into the sleepy village of Pettigrew, the end of its line. Hawk quickly finished sweeping and returned his broom to the station. He watched the brakeman disconnect the engine couplings so the engineer could shuttle the big steam locomotive around to the rear of the train to pull it back to Fayetteville. Hawk liked to watch these small men manipulating such huge pieces of machinery. Hey, Hawk! The man in the door of the freight car called to him and motioned him to come over. Give me a hand. In the door of the freight car were two long wooden boxes made of sanded pine, identical boxes, each over six feet long. The sides of the boxes were not parallel, but tapered out to their widest point at the place where a body's shoulders might be. One by one, Hawk helped the man lower them to the platform, grunting with the weight of them. Hawk judged the contents must be adult and probably male. The coffins were plain, but not cheap, and they looked as if they had been handcrafted by a cabinet maker. They had no labels or tags, and there was no writing on the boxes except, inconspicuously in the corner of the side of each, a letter, M on one, D on the other. Where do I send them? Hawk asked. Well, I ain't freight, the man said. It's baggage. He nodded his head toward the other end of the train where, Hawk saw, the lone passenger, a woman, had just stepped down from the train. She began walking toward the coffins. The man climbed back into the freight car and left Hawk alone with the coffins and the woman. She was just this side of middle-aged, Hawk figured. It isn't easy for a young man of twenty to know whether an older woman is thirty or fifty. She didn't have any wrinkles, but there were a couple wisps of gray among the short blonde hairs that sneaked out the bottom of her hat. She was dressed city-style, but not expensively, and was carrying an old leather suitcase along with her purse and parasol. A little bit on the plump side, Hawk thought, but not at all a bad looker. Well, she said to him, is this Pettigrew? Yes, am he replied, and wondered if the woman was too bereaved to notice these signs. Pettigrew clearly attached the face and sides of the station. And the train won't go any farther? she asked. Can't, he said. Track ends here. The woman turned and stared at the end of the track, and then at the gentle mountains beyond, to the east. She turned back. Are you the station master? she asked. More or less, he said. Could you tell me how far it is to stay more? He studied it. Well, that's clean over in the next county, he told her. Right fur ways over. How long would it take me to get there? She asked and added, with these, the two coffins. You aim to get a motor truck? He asked. If I could, she said. Sherm Crawford had the only truck that he knew of, or the only truck for hire, and Sherm lived half a mile out on the Muddy Gap Road. Hawk didn't even know if the roads between here and Staymore were good enough for a motor truck. He'd heard there was some pretty wild country up around in there. But Sherm seemed to be the only one to ask. Well, why don't we tend to a couple of things, and then I'll see if I can't find you one, Hawk said to the woman. Uh, You can sit inside the station. I'll sit here, she said, and sat on one of the coffins, the one marked D. Hawk finished his chores at the station, then carried two sacks of mail over to the post office. That all the train brought? The postmistress asked him. Gets lighter every time, Hawk observed. He walked on out to Sherm Crawford's house on Muddy Gap Road. The truck wasn't in sight, but Clavina Crawford was sitting on the front porch, churning butter. Howdy, Miss Crawford, he said. Sherm home? No, he's done went to Huntsville with a load of sheep. I don't expect to see him back for the weekend. Oh, Hawk remarked in disappointment. 
There's a lady down the station has two coffins and wants to be drove over to Staymore in Newton County. Who's in the coffins? She didn't say. Well, don't Tim Brashier have a truck? Yeah, but two of the tires is bad and he don't have air to spare. Hmm, said Clovina Crawford. Reckon she'll just have to wait till Sherm gets back, unless she don't mind an ordinary wagon. Hawk walked back into town and told them that there weren't any trucks available. How big a hurry are you in? He asked and realized that didn't sound too polite to a possibly grieving mother or daughter or sister or niece or whatever she was. I mean, did you want to get on up there today or could you wait around a while? The sooner the better was all she would say. <laughs> uh, they, they won't keep, huh? Hawk said, indicating the coffins, but realized that was an awful thing to say. <sighs> They'll keep, the woman said. They're embalmed. Oh, Hawk said. He wasn't sure what embalmed meant, but it sounded like it had something to do with preserving them. When somebody around Pettigrew died, folks got him into the ground as fast as they could. I can get hold of a team and wagon if that ain't too slow for you, he offered. Actually, he'd been thinking about setting his cap for Viola Haskins that evening, but she could wait and he could use whatever money he could get for it. All right, she said. Now? In a couple of winks, he said. Hawk's house wasn't far from the station, just up the hill away. He walked home at a brisk clip and harnessed his two mules and hitched them to the wagon. He climbed up and drove to the porch of his house, where his mother was standing. "'Where are you off to, boy?' she asked. "'Well, there's a lady with two coffins down the station wants to be drove plumb over to Staymore in Newton County,' he said. "'Huh?' his mother said. "'Who's in the coffins?' "'Darn if I know,' he said. "'I never asked her.' "'Oh, you won't get back before sundown or even tomorrow,' she said. "'Hold on a minute and let me fix you something.' Hawk waited while his mother hurried around in the kitchen and came back with a sack full of food and a half-gallon jar of milk. She aimed to pay you right well? His mother asked. Oh, I never asked her, Hawk said. Then, look for me when you see me, he said with a smile and drove back to the station. The train had pulled out on its way back to Fayetteville, so he drove his wagon out onto the tracks and up alongside the platform to where the coffins were. The platform was high enough that he could slide and tilt each coffin up into the wagon without asking the woman for any help. There was just enough room in the wagon for the two coffins to rest side by side. Okay, Hawk said to the woman. We can go. He gave her his hand to assist her up onto the seat of the wagon. Then he sat beside her, clucked at his mules, and they were off. Hawk hoped he could handle the journey without any trouble. He figured there wouldn't be any swollen streams to cross. In this time of June, all the creeks were low, hardly ever above the hubs. But the road was rough, and his wagon had no springs. The seat they sat upon had springs, but these didn't do much to cushion the worst jolts. It was not long before Hawk noticed that the woman was not enjoying the ride at all. She was trying to clutch her purse with one hand and hold onto the wagon seat with the other, and not doing a very good job of either. Her face was pale, and her eyes looked pained, and she was gritting her teeth. I can turn back, he offered. The road's worse than I figured. No, she said. Go on. They rode in silence for a while before the woman asked him, What's your name? Hawk Tuttle, he said. What's yours? Mrs. Wilson, she said. She is not going to get familiar, Hawk decided. That was just as well. He had no particular curiosity about her. She was a live body whom he was transporting along with two dead bodies. Whether or not they were also Wilson's, he did not really care. After he got her to stay more, he would more than likely never see her again. Is that a nickname? she asked. A witch. Hawk, she said, like the bird. No, nah, that's just the way it said, Hawk told her. After a few more miles in silence, she asked, How old are you? Twenty, ma'am, 
he replied, and before he could stop himself, he asked, How old are you? Uh, You aren't supposed to ask that, she said. Yeah, he said. Excuse me. The road eastward as far as Red Star is uphill nearly all the way, and the mules took long, slow steps to pull their load, and occasionally Hawk had to remind them by lashing the reins against their backs. Red Star is at the watershed divide, the streams to the west flowing into the White River, those to the east draining into the buffalo. From Red Star onward, they would go mostly downhill. The first small village they passed through was Boston. The woman asked him, What place is this? And he told her the name of it. Was it named after the other one? She wanted to know. Uh, Which other one? He said. "Uh, There's a Boston in New England she said, the largest city in New England. Hawk remembered hearing something about New England when he had studied geography back in school. It was way off on an ocean somewhere. He wondered if the woman was from New England, but he didn't ask her. A few people in Boston waved politely as they passed, but then squinted their eyes and dropped their jaws to stare at the wagon with the unknown woman and the two coffins. The woman noticed their stares. I guess we are a sight, she observed. Yeah, Hawk said. When they were outside the village, he opened the sack of food his mother had given him, took out ham and biscuit, and extended these to the woman. Had your dinner yet? he asked. She shook her head and thanked him and took the food and ate with him. He did not stop the wagon to eat, but he had to stop it to drink, passing the half-gallon jar of milk to the woman, who drank from it, and then drinking in his turn and driving on. That is good milk, the woman remarked. Much richer than what we get in the city. It's good, he agreed. He'd spent some time seeing to that the cow pasture was kept in good growth. As the afternoon passed on, the woman asked, Do you think we'll be there before dark? I kind of doubt it, he said. He was getting into unfamiliar country now, and would have to stop eventually and ask for directions. He did not know where Staymore is exactly. He knew only that it is north of Swain and south of Jasper. If they could reach Fallsville by sundown, they'd be doing good. I would hate to have to spend the night with those, the woman said, indicating the coffins. Hawk looked at her. Didn't you, last night? On the train, she said, but they were in the baggage car. Where'd you come from? he asked. The woman laughed. I never meant that to be funny, he protested. No, she said, but laughed again. It's just that you haven't asked me anything. You aren't very nosy, are you? I reckon not, he said. It was not that he wasn't nosy. He just didn't much care. He didn't care to know where she had come from, but since she was talking to him, he felt obliged to make talk. This is pretty country, she remarked, and the air smells so fresh. He had not noticed, but he said, I reckon. Are you married? she asked. Nah, I still live at home, he said, and would not need to return that question, even if he cared, because she had already said she was Mrs. Wilson. Planning to be? she asked. Sooner or later, I reckon, he said. The next village they passed through was Red Star, and again the woman asked him, What place is this? And when he told her the name of it, she asked, Why is it called that? I don't rightly know, he said. It's always been called that. Again, people waved at them as they passed and squinted to see what cargo they were carrying. There was a stretch of road east of Red Star which was very bad. Some of the holes and ruts were nearly hub-deep, and although Hawk slowed the mules and kept them reined, the wagon was jarred and tossed so much that the woman's face actually began to turn green. Suddenly she cried, Stop! And as soon as he had stopped, she leaped down from the wagon and knelt beside the road and retched, upchucking all the ham and biscuit and milk she'd had for dinner. He went to her and lay his hand on the back of her neck. That was supposed to help. After a while, she rose to her feet and got a handkerchief from her purse and wiped her mouth with it. She looked at him as if to find some indication of his reaction to what she had done, and then said, as if apologizing, It wasn't the food. It was the ride. 
I'm all right now. She climbed back up into the wagon. He drove very slowly thereafter, but she, noticing this, said, It's all right now. The bumps won't bother me now. Let's get on. He drove a bit faster. They came to a clearing at the crest of a hill, and a long panoramic sweep of hills in the Buffalo Headwater country came into view. The woman gasped in delight and said, It's beautiful. I've never been in this part of the country before. A short while later, they retreated to a dazzling sunset, and the woman said, Just look at that. This is really God's country. Hawk was embarrassed at such displays of emotion and kept his eyes on the backs of the mules. He was aware that the woman sensed he wasn't sharing her sunset with her, and he mumbled, Aw, shoot, I've seen better. You must have, she said. You're very lucky to live in this part of the country. Yeah, I guess so, he said, although he had never given it any thought, and more often than not, he figured that his luck was pretty bad sometimes in the long run. Tell me what Staymore is like she requested. Never been there, he said. Oh, but you know how to get there? More or less, though when we get to Fallsville, I reckon I'd best find somebody to point out the right way. They passed a house which had a sign tacked to an oak tree beside the road. Real lemonade. The E's were backwards, Hawk noticed. He wondered if Mrs. Wilson might like a drink if there was a bad taste in her mouth. He was a bit thirsty himself and very partial to lemonade when he could get it. He pointed the sign out to her and asked, Care for any? She read the sign. Lemonade, she said. I didn't know they grew lemons in this part of the country. Well, they don't, Hawk said, but there's a fruit wagon passed through every month or so. He stopped his wagon. The only person at the house was a man sitting on the porch. When Hawk stopped the wagon, the man got up and came down to them. Howdy, he said. Howdy, Hawk replied. Could we get us some lemonade? Sure, the man said and returned to the porch where he took two gourd dippers and stuck them into a crock and brought them out and gave one to each of them. Of course, there wasn't any ice in it this time of the year, but it was made with cold spring water and was still pretty cold. It was good. It's good stuff, Hawk declared. Mmm, Mrs. Wilson said. Yes. The man noticed the two coffins in the wagon. Are you folks heading? He asked. Stay more, Hawk replied. The man looked sorrowfully at Mrs. Wilson. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away, he said. The man took off his hat and held it against his heart. Over yonder in glory, the Lord has a mansion awaiting for us. Hawk finished his lemonade in a few swallows. We'll all meet again on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by, the man declared. Mrs. Wilson finished her lemonade and returned the gourd dipper to the man. This world of sorrow and woe will be no more, the man said. This time of toil and trouble will be forgotten. That's my good lemonade, Hawk declared. How much we owe you for it? That's the usual nickel, man said, but what is money in a time of sorrow? Let's us lay up our treasures in that home above. Mrs. Wilson insisted on giving the man two nickels. As they drove away, the man said, Just lean on the Lord, sister. There were falls at Fallsville, and Hawk stopped the wagon for a brief moment so the woman could admire the falls. Near the falls was a house, a cottage of cedar stained by dampness and lack of light, but looking well-kept and loved by those who lived there. A family of three who were sitting on the porch enjoying the breeze after their supper. Hawk stopped the wagon again. Howdy, he said. Do you folks tell us how to get towards Staymore? The father came down from the porch and, with a stick, drew a road map in the dust of the yard. Take this here left prong when you come to Swain and just keep on it for three mile. One of the family, a small child, said, Ma, what they got in them big boxes? The mother hushed the child and said, Them's coffins, hun. With dead people, shh, the mother said. You hush now. I thank you kindly, 
Hawk said to the father and started the mules. Hold on, the father said. You'll never make it for dark. Better just stay the night with us. Hawk stopped the mules. He knew that such an invitation, even if wanted, must be declined twice as a matter of proper formality before being accepted. We thank you kindly, he said, but we'd best be getting on. No sense in that, the father said. Unhitch the wagon and rest your bones. We're obliged and beholden, Hawk said, but it's yet a while to dark. Time you uns get up that hill yonder, the father said. It'll be too dark to see them mules' tails. Light down now, I say, and let's feed them critters. If we wouldn't be any bother, Hawk said. He climbed down and went around the wagon to help Mrs. Wilson down. She seemed hesitant or reluctant and said quietly to him, Where are we going to put the coffins? Under his breath, he replied, Let's just wait and see. To the father, he said, Where can I put my wagon out of your way? Wherever you like. Put it in my barn, why don't you? Hawk looked at Mrs. Wilson. She asked, Can he lock the barn? I reckon not, Hawk said. Nobody never locks nothing hereabouts. But you ain't worried they'll rise up and walk off, are you? The woman looked stricken, and he realized he had said possibly an unkind thing. I mean, nobody'd want her steal in coffins, would they? I would simply feel better if, she began. Tell you what, Hawk offered. I'll sleep in the barn with him and keep my ear cocked. She looked at him with awe, as if she doubted that anybody would dare do such a thing. Hawk couldn't help but feel a little proud of his nerve. While he didn't exactly relish the idea of sleeping in the barn with dead people, it didn't frighten him in the slightest. Nothing, as far back as he could remember, had ever frightened him. You don't have to do that, she protested. I don't care, he said. Well, if you're sure, she said. Hawk put the wagon in the barn, unhitched the mules, fed and watered them, twice declined the man's invitation to supper, and then accepted. 